Hello, and thank you for joining us for this special event to commemorate the 67th anniversary of the Supreme Court's landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education. It is my pleasure to welcome the 12th U.S. Secretary of Education, Dr. Miguel Cardona, who will give this evening's opening remarks. Please join me in welcoming Secretary Cardona. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm honored to be here with you. As she said, my name is Miguel Cardona and I'm proud to serve as the Secretary of Education. Glad to be here with the struggle for justice, NAACP's Legal Defense Fund Brown and Black Student Leaders. Thank you for putting this event together to honor this 67th anniversary of this landmark case. Thank you, President uh, Sherilyn uh, Eiffel for your leadership. I'm honored to be here. Um, it's over 60 years since the Supreme Court ruling. And tonight we recognize the courage, the uh, conviction and the constructive change that students have always brought to this cause. We know their names, the sacrifices and successes, the young heroes like the Little Rock Nine and James Meredith, Ruby Bridges and Leona Tate, who were privileged to have with us tonight. At age six, she took a stand. The next generation, of black student leaders will play an important role in advancing equity, especially now post pandemic. I wanna thank the young leaders of Teens Take Charge. You and countless students like you are the future of civil rights in America. You know, we know we can forge opportunity out of this crisis that we're experiencing together. Brown rejected separate but equal, but the work to achieve true lasting equity is far from over. You know, I don't have to tell you that we just, we're getting through two traumas, not only the trauma of the pandemic, but also the trauma of the structural inequities that were exacerbated by the pandemic. We know that when we reopen schools, we still have so much work to do. We need to maintain that level of urgency to make sure that we don't have disparate exclusionary practices in our school. We need to make sure that students are able to learn uh, at high levels in all schools. And we need to make sure that we address the normalization of failure that has become too common in our schools. Dr. Noguero called it the normalization of failure, where we've almost become desensitized to the fact that some students are achieving at higher levels than others. We have work to do. I'm pleased that with the uh, new administration, President Biden understands the important role of education to provide that level playing field so that all students have access to not only a quality uh, education program, but also access to affordable college. The American Rescue Plan provides funds so that we can put the funds where it's needed most, where those communities that have been impacted the most have the resources they need to recover and build back better. We have a lot of work to do and it's gonna take strong leadership at all levels, including from our students to make sure we get the work done. It's important that as we reopen, we use our schools as the best lever for equity. We know that right now, the reopening efforts are not, are not consistent, that some students are getting into school more than other students. And we have to do more to make sure that our black and brown students are entering our schools and having access to quality education. That is our work. That is the, the best equity lever we have. And when we do that, we have to make sure we're providing affordable early childhood education, ensuring that every child, regardless of zip code or circumstance, gets high quality education. We have to expand college and career pathways. We can reimagine education and we can fulfill the promise of Brown. I look forward to leading that charge and working with you to make sure that it happens. Thank you for the opportunity to present with you here today and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you, Secretary Cardona, for your important message. And on behalf of the staff and board of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, we thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight's program will be moderated by LDF's Associate Director Counsel, Janae Nelson. As an organizational thought leader at LDF, Janae works with the President and Director Counsel to determine and execute LDF's strategic vision and oversee the operation of its programs. She is also a member of LDF's litigation and policy teams, and was one of the lead counsel in Vesey v. Abbott in 2018, a federal challenge to Texas's voter ID law. 
Janae is a recipient of the 2013 Derek A. Bell Award from the American Association of Law Schools Section on Minority Groups and was named one of Lawyer of Color's 50 Under 50 Minority Professors Making an Impact in Legal, legal Education. Her scholarship centers on domestic and comparative election law, race, and democratic theory, and she has taught courses in election law and political participation, comparative election law, voting rights, professional responsibility, and constitutional law. Please join me in welcoming Janae Nelson. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you, Secretary Cardona. And thank you all for joining us this evening for this important discussion on the legacy of Brown versus Board of Education. Today, we celebrate the 67th anniversary of the first landmark decision in Brown v. Board, which was decided in 1954 and ended state-sponsored segregation in public schools and led to the disintegration of state-sponsored segregation in all sectors of society. On most days, we may take for granted the new world that Brown created, one rid of legal separation of the races in public life. But today, I am glad that you are joining me and the entire staff of the Legal Defense Fund to pause and acknowledge the transformational impact of this critical case. Brown represents the triumph of the rule of law over injustice, the triumph of brilliant lawyers and courageous clients over the systemic racism that is designed to keep them as second-class citizens. Brown also represents a triumph of activism and organizing over entrenched systems of inequality. In many ways, it represents American democracy at its most noble moment. And today, we're gathering to celebrate this decision each year on the anniversary of this ruling, we lift up the transformational decades long work and strategy of the LDF lawyers who litigated Brown. We celebrate the tenacity and vision of our founder Thurgood Marshall and other lawyers who litigated Brown like Constance Baker Motley and Jack Greenberg and Spotswood Robinson and Robert Carter and many others, as well as our clients, the young people and their families who courageously took the step to become integrators. Now, if you noticed earlier, I said the first Brown decision. One year after the Supreme Court ruled in the five consolidated cases from Kansas, Delaware, Virginia, South Carolina, and DC that came to be known as Brown v. Board, it ruled in a sequel case, Brown II. Brown II held that states should integrate public schools with, quote, all deliberate speed. This decision, and in particular, that statement by the Supreme Court allowed the conditions of segregation and grave racial disparities in educational opportunity, quality and access to persist today. Last year, we commemorated the 65th anniversary of Brown II with a riveting conversation between LDS President and Director Counsel Sherilyn Eiffel and Pulitzer Prize winner and staff writer at the New York Times Magazine, Nicole Hannah-Jones. They spoke about the lasting effects of that decision. The link to this conversation and previous LDF commemorations of Brown are on the screen and linked in the description box of this event. And I hope that you will take some time to look at them and check them out and learn even more. This year, We've decided to devote our Brown commemoration to the intergenerational legacy and power of student activists, the trailblazers of the past and present who fight to uphold the values of Brown and ensure education equity for all. I am thrilled and deeply honored to be joined by legendary community activist and civil rights trailblazer, Mrs. Leona Tate. Ms. Tate played a crucial role in the early civil rights movement, becoming one of the first black students to segregate a school in the Deep South, in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans, Louisiana, to be exact. On November 16, 1960, six years after Brown ruled segregated schools unconstitutional, six-year-old Leona Tate, Gail Etienne, and Tessie Provost were escorted by federal marshals through a mob of angry protesters to attend and integrate the McDonough 19 public school. 
In 2009, Ms. Tate created the Leona Tate Foundation for Change to continue educating the public, especially young people, on civil rights and the ongoing fight for equality. Her bravery and resilience continue to inspire new generations of students to uphold the promise of Brown. I am equally excited to be joined by student activists Stephanie Pacheco and Latoya Beecham of Teens Take Charge. Teens Take Charge is a public school student-led education equity movement that was founded in 2017 by students. LDF was privileged to represent Teens Take Charge in a case demanding racial equity and admissions to specialized high schools in New York City. Teens Take Charge has helped force the crisis of school resegregation to the forefront of New York's political agenda by confronting Mayor de Blasio and New York City Schools Chancellor and other leaders. These students have introduced their own proposals to help desegregate public schools and suggested reforms, including eliminating the specialized high school admissions tests and overhauling the city's hyper-segregated, gifted and talented programs. Stephanie and Latoya are on the front line of the fight for education equity today. Stephanie is a student activist from the South Bronx who is working to expand the conversation about school segregation beyond progressive pockets to affected communities throughout the city. And last summer in an op-ed for Teen Vogue, Latoya called on New York City government officials to continue the New York City Summer Youth Employment Program. Students like Stephanie and Latoya give us hope they give us hope that the coming generation is just as fired up and ready to create new opportunities for themselves and those that follow as their forebearers. So please join me in welcoming Leona Tate, Stephanie Pacheco, and Latoya Beecham. Hello. 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 How's everyone doing? we are doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, you are so very welcome. It's wonderful to see everybody. So Ms. Tate, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you and I'd like to ask you a little bit about your story. At only six years old, you and your classmates were asked to take on something quite extraordinary. You were asked to pick up the mantle of Brown and become the first to integrate your school. Can you share with us what you remember from that first day and how you and your family came to play that historic role? Sure. I can remember it like it was today. Um, I woke up that morning to a house filled with family and friends, um, not understanding what was really going on, mm. but I knew I was going to a different school. I just didn't know why. I um, remember how happy the household was until a black car pulled up in front of the door and things got real quiet. And that was the U.S. Marshal arriving to escort us to the new school. At six years old, still not understanding what was going on, I was pretty happy to get a ride to school where I had been walking for the last year or so. We, um, I can remember getting to the door and my mother said, when you get in the car, sit to the back of the window and do not put your face to the window. And I tell children today, obedience played a big part of what we had to do in those days. Mm. So we journeyed with the, it was two U.S. marshals to each car. And it was my mother and I the first day. Um, and school was in the neighborhood where I live. So we didn't really have far to ride. Um, and we, we came in from the rear of the building. And when we turned on the street, which is the front of the building, which is St. Claude Avenue, I mean, it was just a crowd, a mass of people, and all I could hear was a, a, a loud noise. And the only thing that I could relate it to at that time was that a parade was coming because I knew a parade passed on that street. And, you know, I couldn't understand why I had to go to school and everybody else got to watch the, the parade, you know. So my mother indicated that that was not the case. So, so we did get to enter the building um, without any problems because the crowd was well held back by police on horseback. And from what I understand, that was because they were so well experienced with the parade. So they did well in holding the crowd back. And um, we entered the um, upstairs, 
which led us to the principal's office. And um, we were asked to take a seat on the bench that was outside of the office in the hallway. And we sat on that bench practically half the day or more un until we were finally placed in the classroom. I can remember trying to speak to a little white girl and it was like I was invisible. She didn't look at me. Oh. No response at all. Parents started coming and just pulling their kids out of the out of the classrooms. Just it was it was like a whirlwind. They were pulling them out so fast. Um, by three o'clock, Tessa Gill and myself were the only three students in that building. I understand there were two brothers that lasted till the end of the week, but we never saw them. We had a very good teacher, a teacher that you would have thought wasn't from Louisiana, but she was. Um, and she gave us what we, a, a excellent first grade education, what we you know should have had. And I'm sure her returning back to her community wasn't easy. Um, and that lasted for a year and a half. We weren't allowed to play in the yard. We weren't allowed to eat in the cafeteria. We weren't allowed to drink from the water fountains. They were turned off. The windows were, were papered. We couldn't see outside and no one could see inside. Um, our play area was under a stairwell right outside of the classroom. And it was just, we were comfortable, but we didn't realize how confined we really were and how dangerous it could have been. Um, Second grade started off the same way. Each day we entered the building, there was a crowd outside and that lasted till Christmas. When we returned after the Christmas holidays, um, we had 25 other students to join us. And all of the students were black except two. Mm -hmm. So that led, that led another, another movement. The thing was to keep us in a white school. So McDonough 19 had become a black school after that year. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, it always strikes me when people can sit and testify as to what happened in our lifetimes. And it is easy to think that this is ancient history, but you are uh, living proof that it isn't. And what you and your family had to endure is, is quite remarkable. I'm, I'm curious about how your mother and your family made the decision to have you be the integrator and to put yourselves on the front lines of this struggle. And I think of you know the Brown decision and what it was most concerned with was the effect of segregation on public education, the effect of segregation on black children. That was the premise, although we know that they had ample evidence of the effect of segregation on, on white children as well. Uh, the court said that, that it could inculcate feelings of inferiority in black children and make, make it can affect their minds in ways that could likely never be undone. I, I wondered how you felt in those moments when you were in the school and your classmates had left and uh, you saw resegregation occur within a year and a half of, of you taking that very bold step and your family being so brave. And what psychological effect do you think it had on those white classmates of yours who, who did not take the opportunity to get to know you and to take advantage of having someone like you in their classes? Well, Janine, I wonder, I wonder about that too today if I could really meet anyone from those days, but um, <clears throat> it was, my parents didn't talk about me, talk around me so that I would be afraid. So I can say I was never really afraid because I just didn't, I guess not by not understanding. So, um, but we did realize that we were alone. We did question not being able to play outside and, and do the normal things that you would do in the classroom. So, but we were fine. I mean, we, we, we had the three of us and I guess that was so, put in our heads that we just had to stick together. You know, we we knew ahead of time that once we got in this building, we didn't leave each other. You know, we did everything 
to, together. You know, there were brainwashing tactics, but that didn't probably didn't come until we got in maybe third or fourth grade. We, you know, there were tactics that if we got in any trouble or or did anything that, you know, would get us put out of school, we'd never be able to go back to school again. But um, that first and second year, we were pretty much fine. We were, we, it was really peaceful for us for that first year. But third grade was horrendous. It was just, I wouldn't wish that on nobody's child. Nobody. It was, I don't know. And it just, we didn't have security at that time. You know, we, we had to endure what we had to go through for it to work. Mm. I'm thinking that was the only way they thought it would, it would, it would work is because we had to be threatened or we'd be called names, but we were prepared. We were so well prepared. I, you know, I'm assuming they had a way of preparing us to that we knew that we would hear these things and they let it go in one ear and come out the other ear. You know, um, if anything got too hard for you, then we had people to go to. We had a village in those days. You know, we, our parents had support. You know, they, you know, it's not the same anymore. It's just not the same. Yeah. Well, let me say uh, on behalf of the, the, the millions of students who followed you, thank you for making that sacrifice for us. It, it, it absolutely could not have been easy. And you talked about creating a community having a village. And I want to bring Latoya and Stephanie into the conversation because a number of students in New York City have created a community uh, through Teens Take Charge to take on education inequity. And they have been a force to be reckoned with. They have really uh, fashioned themselves into a, a cohort of individuals that politicians pay attention to, that the news media pays attention to, because they have been so vocal and outspoken and so on point with the issues that they've raised about inequity in the public school system in, in myriad ways. So I wanna bring them into the conversation and, and ask you, Stephanie and Latoya, whether anything Ms. Tate just described resonated with you in terms of your connection as, as high schoolers in New York, which as we know is one of the most segregated school systems in the country. Almost 75% of black and Latinx students go to schools that are less than 10% white and white students are largely in schools that are over 50% white. So we know that resegregation has occurred in New York and it's not just a Southern problem. So I'm eager to hear if you can tell us a little bit more about uh, what Ms. Tate said and how it might have resonated with you and your experiences in New York. Um, thank you so much. I feel like everything that Ms. Tate has spoke about has literally resonated with me and it's just amazing to do that at such a young age. Um, and I'm 17 years old and doing that right now. I'm just like, oh. But um, one thing I definitely say is when it comes to um, looking at how things are right now, especially when it comes to the resegregations of our schools, um, not many people know about it. I mean, like we have um, the cases and um, different things like that, but um, not many people in our schools really know like what's going on and that um, that we don't have all the opportunities we should have and that um, other people are getting different quality learning than we are. And um, it really makes me think about it that we really have to call attention to this because it's like, this is putting you at a disadvantage and you don't know about it. Mm -hmm. And it just really like inspires me to advocate for change and just like spread the word about like, this is what's happening in our schools. And that's literally what Ms. Tate did and it's amazing. Thank you so much. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Stephanie. Thank you for that Latoya. Um, firstly, I, I'm, just, I'm just so blown away to be in this space. Um, I'm like struggling to find words to answer this question because I'm just so in shock. Um, and I second what Latoya said. I wanted to start off by that. I absolutely second what you said. Um, I go to schools and I believe Latoya as well. We go to those schools that are segregated and have less than 10% white students, less than 5% white students. Um, and so many students are just we've just been conditioned to believe that we don't get the education that we deserve because we're not good enough. Um, we don't know that there are students that are receiving a different education. So I, I thank you, Latoya, for bringing that up. And to more directly answer your question, um, the one part that really stood out to me about what Ms. Tate said is um, about having a village, about having um, 
a support system to make that incredible moment and that bravery happen. Um, and I agree that in some ways it's like, some people really struggle to, to find that village. I struggle to find that village. Um, but I think what's unique about Teen Sick Charge is that we've created that village. We've created an incredible support system of black women, like the ones that are in this space right now, of other students that are tired of settling in this school system, of people who have been in this fight for decades and other people that are just joining and deciding that they're not satisfied with the current state of our system. So it really does res resonate with, you, with me that um, you had a village to make it all possible. And I believe that I've been lucky enough to create my village and my village is here, so. Well, thank you, Stephanie. I, I actually want to stick with you for a minute because you said something quite profound. Um, as you know, the Supreme Court held that separate but equal public school facilities are inherently unequal. It, it, it overturned legal precedent in Plessy versus Ferguson uh, to hold that separate but equal violates the protections of the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause in particular. You said when you were 15 years old that segregation is a barrier, no matter how smart you are, no matter how much work you put in. You told that to the New York Times. Can you explain more about what you meant by that? No matter how smart you are, no matter how much you work you put in, segregation is a barrier. Um, wow. Um, that makes me think of when I was in the eighth grade, um, my entire graduating class was just full of driven students. Um, ready to tackle this admissions process, thinking that we were different because we worked hard and we were able to get good grades and we spent hours studying in the library and we believed to be smart and we were told that we were smart and that made us believe that we were worthy because we are. But that admissions process didn't see any of that. We were in numbers, um, numbers that weren't good enough. Um, and I, I constantly, I still think about this. Now I'm a senior and I'm about to graduate and I still think about how no matter how hard me and my peers work, no matter how many hours we spend studying in the library, no matter what we do, um, it boils down to the fact that we're black and we're brown and we're low income and we're from the South Bronx and that doesn't cut it in the school system. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of layers to that statement, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that and unpacking that statement. Uh, I I imagine, Ms. Tate, you can relate to some of the struggles that Stephanie and LaToya are facing today. And uh, while there's been so much progress due to the sacrifice of people like you and Ruby Bridges and Barbara Johns and so many other brave young women in particular who led student protests and movements, we still see that so many of our young people are still suffering in segregated classrooms. And I saw an interview uh, where you described the challenges and you started to talk about this today about being in a classroom with, with white students and teachers who didn't believe you belong there. And, and while the attitudes might not be so overt today, many black students and other students of color speak out about feelings of isolation and exclusion, uh, even in integrated environments. What would you say to those students who find themselves still integrating education spaces today, still navigating those places. I just I just promote to them to them to just to stay focused. You know, um, whatever's out there and whatever it is that you're seeking to do or whatever you can do it. You know, just don't let the negative stuff get in your way. Um, and truly, it's going to be driven in front of you. Just don't don't let anything just hold you back because of their numbers. Um, I find that a lot of schools here today are just, we already was behind time in doing the desegregation of the schools. We were six years behind Brown versus the Board of Education. Mm -hmm. So New Orleans, you know, is really, we, we're, we're just really behind time. But I find that the schools here today, no, they don't talk about it, you know, but I feel like the civil rights needs to be taught and it, they need to know so they can understand 
where they're coming from, where they're going, what they want to do, and how much strength they have to do it. And just stay focused. That's you know that that's all I can ask you to do. It's all I can ask you to do is just stay focused and keep doing what you're doing in the community. They they need that. They need students to. Um, I was so proud of the protesters this year behind with the George Floyd um, incident. They they were all colors. They stuck together. That's the kind of stuff we need to do. That's right. That's why we wanted to bring together this this intergenerational group uh, so you all can inspire one another because it does take that type of resolve and focus that you talked about. Um, I wanted to turn back to, to Latoya uh, and ask a question about Brown. And, and one of the findings in Brown that I think we all know wasn't necessarily borne out on the ground was that segregated schools had been equalized or, or they were being equalized with respect to buildings and curricula and the qualifications and salaries of teachers and other tangible factors. But we know even then and still now resources are not equal among public schools. And you wrote quite powerfully, Latoya, about the lack of opportunities for many public school students in segregated and underfunded school systems. You talked about the lack of exposure that they have to professions they may want to pursue like medicine, which I know you have an interest in and other professions. So maybe you can talk about what, what school systems and government officials can do to create more access for students to level the playing field outside of the classroom. Thank you so much. I think, first of all, um, when it comes to that question, I feel like we really have to look at like the different opportunities that we have. Like um, in my school, we don't we don't even have a music program. And there's other schools that have music program, piano lessons, this and that, and so much opportunities. And if they don't have those opportunities, they have someone who can supply them with those opportunities. And then we are just like placed at the bottom as if like we don't deserve those opportunities when it's not so. And we also deserve those opportunities to get ahead. Um, so I feel like one thing we first need to focus on is um, first of all, seeing ourselves in um, education and um, when it comes to teaching our history, that's number one. And number two, it really has to speak about like our teachers, the quality of teachers, the quality of teachers that are being put inside of our schools and what they can teach us and that they're here to do more than just their jobs and actually care about students. Because like I've had so many teachers told me that at the end of the day, they still get their paycheck. And then I'm just here like, okay, so again, we're nothing more than just a number. So I feel like it's really about targeting the people that really want to do this work and the work that resonates with them and just um, providing like opportunities that are like, so we can also see where we want to go. Cause again, school is definitely about learning but it's where you discover who you are. So if we don't have those opportunities to discover who we are, it's just like, we're just here learning. And then in the end, it's just like, I did all that learning and now I don't even know who I am. So it's all about building around that and seeing how we can uplift those students to really become who they really want to be. And I want to be in the medical field and my school is helping me do that. And not everyone has the opportunity. And I think that's an opportunity everyone deserves. So yeah, I just want to say that. Thank you. No, that you said that so, so, so powerfully. I think you are 100% right. I mean, school is a place where you can discover who you are, and I, I, I do hope that you are able to get connected to people in the medical profession so that you can have the exposure that you seek. Uh, but, but you know, Brown recognized that. Brown said education is the most important function of state and local governments. It, it talked about the fact that education is is critical to our democratic society. That it's one of our most basic public responsibilities. It's the foundation of good citizenship. It's, it's, quote, the principal instrument in awakening the child to cultural values, preparing him for later professional training, him, her, they, them. Uh, so, so many critical aspects of who we ultimately become as people are rooted in the education that we receive. And so, Ms. Tate, I want to turn this to you and ask, when you hear about the onslaught of legislation that seems to be proliferating at warp speed across the country to prohibit the teaching of civil rights and racial justice history, 
uh, critical race theory. Uh, when we hear about bans on the 1619 project in school curricula, what does that say to you about where our country is in the truth telling that I know you care so deeply about because of the work that you're doing with your foundation? Tell me what your reaction is to this proliferation of legislation that, that seeks to, to keep our students from learning the truth about the history of civil rights and race and the enslavement of Africans in this country. It's, it's, it's reversing what we've done for so many years. And I understand what Latoya and, and Stephanie's talking about. Um, but I, I find myself is why I have, I don't wanna say that's why I put the foundation together, but we put the foundation together just to try to get a school, the school reopened. But when I visit the schools and see that they know nothing about the history that happened right here in New Orleans, as far as civil rights is concerned, that bothered me. And I can come to New York probably to Latoya School and they know all about it. It's just that maybe it's not being handled the right way. But I don't know. I just I. I didn't know what to do about it in the beginning. And then I thought about, well, if, if McDonough 19 is not going to be a, a regular school again, it needs to be something where the students can come and find out about their history. They're walking on a lot of history here in New Orleans. They're walking on 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 the like they say, the turf that they, they don't know anything about. They they don't even respect it. I feel like if they would be taught. And, and they can understand what came before them, they'd appreciate it a lot better. You know, um, I feel like the education system is just being discouraging. It's, it's really taking away a lot of stuff that our children need to know. And, and Latoya say like, there's no music programs in their schools. There are a lot of programs that's no longer in the schools and that our children need, our students need. And, and I hope that providing what we, we we're doing at McDonough 19 now is 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 creating that type of environment where they can come, they can have this dialogue on knowing and and and, and learning how to undo this racism. Um, I know it's hard. It's going to be a lot, and it, it's going to take another village to get it done. Really, it really will. That's right. And so, for for those who may not know, uh, the Leona Tate. Foundation for Change uh, seeks to convert the McDonough number 19 public school that she integrated at six years old into an information center. I know you don't want to call it a museum because you want it to be living and breathing and modern, um, but, but the effort there is to convert that school into a place of learning, into a place where students and others can come and find out the true history of segregation and integration and systemic racism in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans. So thank you so much for that work. And, and we obviously want to support you in everything that you're trying to do to lift that, uh, to stand that uh, center up. Um, you said something that was interesting and that is that if you went to Latoya and, and Stephanie's school that maybe you would hear about some of the history that is not being taught in other parts of the country. And I, I really wanna check that, I wanna ask Latoya and Stephanie, uh, one, when when did you learn about Brown versus Board of Education? It, it is a it is a decision that's only 14 pages long. It's a unanimous decision written by Chief Justice Earl Warren, uh, but it's one of the most transformative cases in the history of this country. It changed the entire trajectory of this country and the lives of generations of, of black people and all people. Uh, it, it dismantled legal apartheid in this country. So when did you learn about Brown in school and when? And what do you think the impact will be of, of any uh, limitations on history in school curricula? 
Um, I personally, when it comes to being um in school, they didn't really teach us much about um school um segregation, um school integration, um Brad versus Board of Ed, and not really anything like that. Um, that wasn't until I had um joined Teen State Charge, and we had um series of workshops where we were learning about like different movements, and then um we had read um about Brown versus Board of Ed, and I was like, wow. First of all, I had just learned about the different system put in place, but I was like, wow, this is a movement that clearly impacted who I am today and the education that I'm getting today. So um, that was the first time for me. Um, what about you, Steph? Um, I want to say the first time I heard about um, Brown versus the Board of Education, I want to say it was an elementary school. Um probably from one of my black teachers that I had then. But from that point forward, like I don't remember it really ever being mentioned again, ever, until I joined Teen Sick Charge as well. And we dug deep into that history and acknowledged and honored that history in a way that I never had before. But before that, I wanna say maybe like, it had been since I was literally a child that it was even brought up to me. You know, that, that's all the more reason to commend what Teens Take Charge is doing, that you are filling a void in the public school system. And uh, sometimes we have to, you know, use our own industry, to educate ourselves and to fill in those pieces of history that we're not taught. But it just underscores how deeply threatening this wave of legislation is that seeks to limit even further what students may learn about the civil rights movement and about these seminal cases that uh, are the foundation of our democracy today. I wanna shift gears uh, for a moment just to ask you students how you've been handling COVID-19 and the pandemic and remote learning. I know that it's been a challenge uh, since March, LDF has been fighting to ensure that there's been adequate economic support and other supports for students in need. Uh, we filed multiple cases in, in federal courts and convened strategic partners uh, for concerted advocacy on behalf of Black communities uh, to make sure that uh, they were still, students and their families were still receiving food, uh, that they were having, getting adequate access to technology and adequate learning support. I'm wondering how your schools and how you and your friends and those you know have fared in the pandemic and how has that affected your work as student leaders? Um, I feel like the first thing I'd say was switching from completely um, being in person to being in remote is like a big change. And it was a change that we had to do really quickly. Um, and we had, um, first of all, we were making sure that everyone had the opportunity to have um, laptops, iPads, different things like that. But that was personally my school. And then um, I have other peers that three weeks and four weeks a month still doesn't have any laptops, anything, and doing remote classes on their phone. And that's literally <laughs> no way, if you're switching from this whole different type of structure to something else, you need the resources so you can successfully do it. And that's what we really have to focus on, the disparities that have been exacerbated that, by COVID. And just uh, you really focus on it and then you're really like, wow. So this really affects us all. And then um, I personally, when it comes to um, networking around um, organizing and um, Teen Take Charge, I feel like um, it's really different being um, remote. But um, again, we do live in a time where everything's becoming really um, remote and search engines and uh, we're catching up with technology. So um, it was a shift that was hard, but it was, we were, it wasn't impossible, especially being who we are right now. Um, we're constantly learning new things, how to work different technology. Um, so it was definitely different, but we were able to do it. And I'll pass it over to Steph. Um, I want to say that this is kind of like a layered question because <laughs> there's certain things like we're still in the pandemic and there's still like every day we're just trying to figure things out. Um, but I'll say, and I feel like a lot of my peers and my friends can agree with me that like 
we just we felt really like neglected by our individual schools and the school system at large like for a while new york city like prided itself on like getting technology out to all of its students like that wasn't true um a lot of my friends still like don't have functioning devices and we're over a year into the pandemic um and there's just so many different like ways that we've been impacted but um, like Latoya briefly mentioned, it's like these were things that like already existed. Um, part of the reason why I like constantly tell people that I'm from the South Bronx is because of like the context of like what that means. The South Bronx hasn't had adequate health care um, for ever. Um, people have been unhoused and facing housing and food insecurity for so long. We've been neglected by our school system by, for so long. Um, our communities have been rampant with police, but not rampant with resources and things that we need to survive for so long. So that, like Latoya said, has just been exasperated um, during the pandemic. And it's it's been it's been a struggle, but like Miss Tate said, you know, it's it's been taking a village and like like always we 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 found community to fall back on. So like we're barely surviving but like yeah yeah i listen i i take my hat off to every student and 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 teacher and anyone in the school system who has had to live through this past year in the way that you have it's it's a challenge that is really hard to imagine um but you all seem like you're thriving despite it all and uh that's really commendable but i know that it it hasn't been easy i know that you also don't get the opportunity to speak to an activist as wise and experienced as Mrs. Tate uh, on a regular basis. And we are nearly out of time for our conversation. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to ask her you know, any question you might have or share a, a parting thought with her if you have one before I turn to Mrs. Tate. Um, I, I can go first. Um, yes, I feel like I feel like kind of a broken record saying this, but I just want to like restate that it is just such an honor to be here. Such such an honor. I still haven't fully processed all of it, but it is such immensely such an immense honor. Um, and I often say, um, like in in the advocacy world and just how I navigate my day-to-day -day life in general, I often say that like, I, I'm okay because like, my ancestors are with me, my community's with me, my elders are with me. And like, I have a village with me at all times, even if they're not physically there with me. Um, usually that's like an energy that I feel of like protection and like security. But today it's like, it's in person, it's real. Well, not, well, as in person as we can be. Um, but it's, it feels real and it's an honor. And I just, every day in our space, we honor trailblazers like you, Miss Tate. So I'm just very grateful to be here. And this was amazing. Thank you so much. But I guess you can hear my voice that most everything that I talk about is more sentimental to me than anything. Um, just, I'm, I'm, I'm really proud of you too. I, I wish I had that much fight in me as a young girl, then waited till I was 40 years later to try to do what I'm doing, but um, it's happening. It needs to happen. If you're ever, ever in New Orleans, we have now, Janae purchased the building. We are under construction and hope to be opening probably the early fall of this year and, um, and hopefully this will be a, a, the building to me is where I was introduced to racism. Mm -hmm. I want to end it in the same location. Well, thank you, Ms. Tate. That's a perfect way to end this conversation. I want to thank all of you for being so forthcoming and sharing your thoughts with us in commemoration of Brown. We wanted to have an intergenerational dialogue and that's exactly what you all provided uh, from, from different places and different spaces and different generations, but all speaking in the same voice of progress and resilience. So thank you so much. I, I hope everyone will join me in thanking our speakers for joining us tonight for this powerful conversation. 
uh, it was really wonderful to hear from these brilliant activists who continue to fight to uphold the values of Brown versus Board of Education. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. LDF continues the fight every day to uphold the promise and values of Brown. And I'm especially proud of our most recent endeavor, the Marshall Motley Scholars Program, named at, in honor of LDF's founder, Thurgood Marshall, and legendary lawyer, Constance Baker Motley. This audacious pipeline program is designed to endow the South with the next generation of civil rights lawyers trained to provide legal advocacy of unparalleled excellence. We will close tonight's event with an introduction to this program from none other than Yara Shahidi, actress, producer, change agent, and breakout star of ABC's Emmy and Golden Globe nominated comedy ABC series Blackish and its spinoff Grownish. She will help introduce us to LDF's first cohort of Marshall Motley scholars. Since the landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education, LDF has fought to ensure that this victory for education equity would not be undermined by financial need caused by other forms of systemic racism. For some students, their dream of college or law school may seem out of reach because of the rising costs of higher education. Providing scholarships to Black students seeking to pursue undergraduate and law school degrees is one of the ways LDF advances educational opportunities. In 1965, LDF created the Herbert Lehman Education Fund, providing financial assistance to undergraduate students of color who had been denied access to higher education for generations. Eight years later, LDF launched the Earl Warren Legal Training Program, offering financial assistance to Black law students to cultivate future generations of civil rights and public interest attorneys. For over 50 years, LDF's scholarship programs have provided more than 5.6 million of financial support to over 2,000 students. LDF scholarships have supported numerous distinguished leaders, including Congressman James Clyburn, Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, Marion Wright Edelman, founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund, and Verna Bailey, the first African-American woman undergraduate student at the University of Mississippi. Today, the majority of Black people in this country live in the South and continuously face impediments to voting, education equity, and racial and economic justice. For this reason, LDF's litigation practice is rooted principally in the South. Earlier this year, on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, LDF launched a new scholarship program that will deepen its longstanding presence in the South and help leverage the talent, passion, and commitment of a cohort of brilliant civil rights attorneys dedicated to serving Southern Black communities. The Marshall Motley Scholars Program is LDF's bold and intentional investment in populating, developing, and enriching the field of civil rights lawyers committed to racial justice. Named in honor of the civil rights legend Thurgood Marshall, LDF's founder and the nation's first Black Supreme Court Justice, and Constance Baker Motley, former LDF attorney and the first Black woman to become a federal judge, this groundbreaking program will create pathways to leadership, self-sufficiency, and socioeconomic progress while developing individuals to become ambassadors and advocates for transformational change in Black communities. As the South takes on the civil rights struggles of the 21st century, it will need a bold cadre of highly skilled attorneys to break down the barriers opposing justice. The MMSP will see the South with a well-trained and dedicated league of attorneys who will provide superior legal representation to Black communities. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you the first ever cohort of the Marshall Motley Scholars Program. In the civil rights movement's earliest days, Thurgood Marshall formed the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. For over 80 years, in courtrooms across the country, our attorneys have relentlessly fought for the rights we have today. Having those rights, keeping those rights that belong to every American takes work, commitment, 
it is indeed a calling. At a time when those rights are more threatened than ever, our work matters more than ever. That's why today, we are honored to introduce the very first Marshall Motley Scholars. Named for our founder, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, and the iconic litigator, Judge Constance Baker Motley. Scholars are from different backgrounds, yet share the same commitment to uphold, maintain, and protect our civil rights, to answer the call and bring an end to racial injustice. Racial justice and choice-filled lives are not mutually exclusive. As long as I live, I live to fight for freedom. Racial justice in education is when Black students are provided with equitable access to quality public education. In every space, my mission is also to connect with people in ways that ultimately create more just and inclusive communities. Since the age of 11, I have been committed to fighting for equality and justice in the South. In this society, poverty should not be criminalized. I am in the fight for racial justice on behalf of Black people. I hope to be a leader that is a connector between coalitions and builds efficacy in communities by using the law to fuel material change that is larger than me or what any one individual can do. I intend to offer my voice, visibility, and ensure the experiences of my community. It's about changing the narrative and the dynamic and the systemic outlook for African Americans. Good evening. How are you, Ashley? Hi, doing well. How are you all? Doing wonderful, yeah, doing wonderful. Good to see you. We really um, recognize how rigorous this process was. And it's, um, it's one of the reasons why we wanted to just be able to talk to, to finalists personally. But I also wanted to reach out because I wanted to congratulate you on having been selected as a Marshall Motley Scholar. I'm not crying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> For having been selected as a Marshall Motley Scholar. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> I was sitting here, I was like, she was gonna tell me I didn't get it. The way she was going, she me up, I'm like, oh. Sherilyn Eiffel. Oh, hey there. Hi, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Are you? you can unmute. Unmute yourself. You can unmute yourself now. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's really awesome news, uh, especially two days before my graduation. So. Yes, I would think. I would think. I can't wait to get to work for the Marshall Motley Scholars Program, and um, it's just an honor to be a part of the inaugural cohort. Congratulations, Marshall Motley Scholars. Now, let's get to work. Thank you, Yara. We are thrilled to introduce this inaugural cohort of students on the anniversary of Brown. We know these young motivated lawyers will continue to honor its legacy. On behalf of LDF's staff and board and our president, Sherilyn Eiffel, I'd like to thank tonight's speakers, Secretary Cardona, Leona Tate, Stephanie Pacheco, Latoya Beecham, and Yara Shahidi. We are in awe of your inspiring work and are so grateful to you all for joining us this evening to celebrate this important anniversary. Thank you for watching and have a good night.